barbell shirts and Bromley shirts available at barbellapparel.com. Link is in the description. Today, we're doing something we haven't done in a little while, which is go over some lifting technique. We're doing a lot of surface level stuff, programming, you know, looking at the 30,000 foot view, but we gotta get back to movements because that is your bread and butter. The type of movements you select is going to determine how good you potentially get, how much you get out of your workouts, and your approach is gonna determine not only how big does it make you, how much does it grow you, but also, how much weight can you hoist? How advantaged are you? So there's a development, but there's also the performance aspect. What puts you in the best position? And you gotta know when to do what. So I'm going over squatting technique today. We're going over 10 ways to make yourself a better squatter. We're gonna cherry that lift out. Make sure that you don't leave any stone unturned. So the first thing we're gonna talk about technique. Now, I can't give you really specific advice on technique because it's beyond the scope of this video. With individuals who are built a certain way or who have a very specific approach, I mean, you could write an essay on each one of those. I'm going to give the surface level view, which tends to be most people overthinking their squat. Now, you have a couple different types of squatters, people like me, very short legs, stay upright pretty easily. Squatting's a breeze. When your femurs are this long, you know, going down and up is very easy. But some of you guys with really long legs, really short torsos, feels like you have to bend over a lot, or feels like your hips aren't shaped right, like your hips shove your legs straight forward. There's some stuff to work around. So if you feel like it's like walking a tightrope, you're probably gonna have to find a, a more specific and more consistent style of squatting. Most people, like nine out of 10, don't have a build that is so wonky that they have to do that. They just need to find a comfortable stance, practice an air squat in the mirror, make sure they're balanced on their feet, make sure they're not falling over, make sure the bar can stay somewhere over the middle of their foot. The rest is practice. So the big thing with technique, it's not that you're trying to find the perfect one. You're trying to find a good one and then get really, really, really good at that. So you're actually better off, even if it's, let's say not perfect. Let's say you're 8% away from 100% perfect squat technique. Instead of trying to find that 8%, you're actually infinitely better. Just getting really, really good the way you do it. And what you'll find is that as you pay attention, you'll find little things you can clean up here and there and it'll get more precise as time goes on. But most of you just need to let the work grow you as opposed to screwing with your squat. So the first thing is technique. Yes, it's important, but it's technical like making an omelet is technical. There is a right way to do it, but most people can figure it out, right? And there's a lot of play in the joint. So just keep that in mind. Number two, feet. So this will play into technique. I'll get a little more specific here. The big thing with feet really is that some people will have tight ankles if let's say you have the propensity for having your feet roll in that can destabilize you. That comes down to something being tight somewhere up along the chain because you'll notice that if you try to keep your feet to the outside, you can't. Everything collapses in. You got to fix that shit. Even if you don't have that problem, even if you can keep your feet nice and flat, you're going to find that if you spend any amount of time barefoot squatting, just as an accessory every now and then, you're going to notice you feel stronger. That's pretty universal because when your feet are crammed in your shoes, they're just existing. They're not doing anything. When they're spread out, you grab the ground a little bit. They're, they offer a little bit more stability. Feels really good, actually, assuming you have the uh, ankle flexibility to get into a proper position. So I recommend that every now and then, and then carrying that into your competition squat where you get a sense of your toes and you grab on a little bit. It's not a huge point, but when you do it, it can help anchor you a little bit. And you can think of it as like squeezing the bar when you bench, that can give you a little something. Now, as far as balance, you either wanna be balanced generally over the middle of your foot, just not forward or back. It's okay to be on your toes just a little bit, especially if you use a lot of quads. If you bend over a lot, you probably don't wanna be on your toes, but if you use a good amount of quads and you feel that weight shift into your toes as you come up, not necessarily a bad thing, especially wrap squatters, they're gonna feel that quite a bit. So on the topic of feet and then general tightness, I also recommend people when they're new or if you haven't ever worn a squat shoe, one of the first things I do when I'm troubleshooting somebody's squat or teaching them for the first time, find out what their ankle flexibility is because that sidelines so many people. It's not something you just naturally have. We lose it by being inactive. Most of us are inactive. So I will put two and a half pound plates under the heels of all of my clients because out of all the times I do it, there's a really high percentage of people that have their squat immediately go off better. So one, it might be solving an issue of tight ankles or not being able to get the knee forward the way it needs to because the ankles are tight. Two, it might just help conceptualize a squat better. Remember, goblet squats and front squats are a lot more intuitive. So when you're learning the squat, having somebody do that first can kind of reinforce it. And for those movements, you stay upright, which we 
get your knees tracked forward. So that can be cued by lifting the heels a little bit. It's kind of a learning tool to get somebody to conceptualize what it's like to just stay upright and then kind of elevate her down. And again, if you're a pretty experienced squatter, going back to that well might help refine some things that you forgot about or you were taking for granted. So, so feet, I'm not gonna tell you that this is a solution to all your squat woes, but it's something that you can throw in. Again, starting from the ground up, it's easy to do try it out. If you need squat shoes to get into a better position, you feel like you got way more power, absolutely no reason not to do that. Number three is the glutes. I've made a few glute videos as of late. You can check those out on my channel. We go into depth. One of the main points I made about glutes in regards to the activation controversy is people say that you can't squat and not use your glutes. That's probably true. But what I am suggesting is that Muscles aren't either used or not used, that there are varying degrees of efficiency. And that's actually what training is. As you train, you get more efficient, you get more recruitment. And with certain movements, the body can pick up weird little hiccups or yips, or it can bypass what you would think of as normal movement patterns. And I don't think the glutes are different. So when somebody says, hey, you can't not use your glutes when you squat, my response is to have them try this. At the start of a squat, when the bar's on your back and you walk out, flex your quads, so you're straightening your knees out, and then flex your glutes. So you're tucking your hips under. And then to top it off, bring the ribs down like you're about to get punched in the stomach and tense your abs. That's a good solid starting position. Everything's tight, everything's ready to go. So just like when you're at the top of a bench, you're squeezing your hands, your forearms, your triceps, your, your pecs, you're putting some pressure back into the bar and coming down under control. A lot of people don't do that. They just do kind of a blind descent on the squat. So what I suggest that you try, keep the glutes tight, See if you can keep them tight on the descent. Give it a try, try it right now. See if when you break at the hip, if the glutes stay tight the way that any of your musculature would when you break on a bench press. Most of you, I'm going to guess, lose it instantly. And that's just a sign of how you have room to clean it up. Now that might not need years of glute activation work, but there's some proprioception you can get. There's a little bit of receptivity you can find because if you can't engage those, that tells you that you can improve the timing. That tells you that you can improve support. You might be able to initiate a better bounce. So glutes are very important. Don't take for granted that glutes just turn on. With a lot of people, they do. My ass took over my body when I started squatting. I don't have to really worry about that. However, there's a lot of people who have gotten very impressive squats. I've known multiple 600 pound squatters who had flat asses. I've also known elite squatters and deadlifters who suffered from Hank Hill syndrome. So it's a possibility, it's just something to consider, but don't neglect on the glutes. Controversy exists because people recognize that they're very important squatting. So if you can find a way to bring them in a little bit better to increase your timing, your rate of force production, you are going to have a much better time squatting. Number four is, bro are you looking for access to exclusive programs from the best minds in the field and some of your favorite YouTube influencers? then look no further than Boost Camp. Boost Camp is a long-term sponsor of this channel, and I wouldn't be partnered with them if they didn't provide a great product. If you want optimal performance, you cannot just wing your weight selection. You have to make deliberate steps forward. So you need a program and you need a way to track progress on it. They make it easy to track your workouts from the convenience of your phone. So you never have to rely on your sloppy handwriting or your bad memory. And they give you access to a library of exclusive programs from some of the most well-known names in the business. Eric Helms, Bryce Lewis, Jeff Schofield, Bald Omni-Man, and yours truly. We all have programs up there that can only be found on the app and it is absolutely free. My programs Bull Mastiff and 70s Powerlifter are both up there. And you can also check out Full Sturker, which tells you how to get strongman jacked using the things you find in a corporate gym. So a special thank you to Boost Camp for making this channel possible. Unburden yourself from the hard business of making the perfect program from scratch. We've got them pre-made for you download their app right now by clicking the link in the description bracing now i did write a bracing ebook i'm in the process of polishing it up making it a little bit better bringing it up to snuff because it's been quite a while but essentially the muscles around your midsection are what keep your spine rigid your spine is just a bunch of like lincoln logs stacked on top of each other the only reason they don't crumple like a slinky when you load it with hundreds of pounds is because those muscles stay tight. So don't just take for granted that because you're standing upright, your abs are doing what they should be doing. In that setup I just went over, squeeze the quads, squeeze the glutes, bring the ribs down. That bringing your ribs down is your cue to do what I would refer to as cannonball bracing, which is locking everything down like a briefcase and then tensing as if you're about to take a cannonball to the gut. 
That's not the big belly breath where you fill your rib cage with air and then shove your abs out into a belt like multiply lifters used to do back in the day. Find the guys that were doing that in the 90s and 2000s. See what kind of health their hips and spine are in today. It's a recipe for movement dysfunction and it actually doesn't make you as stable. It's quick and dirty. If you find yourself under like a 1500 pound yoke, yeah, but you can take the time to practice to set up in a squat. And once you do that, what you're going to do is ensure that force transfer when you hit up into the bar is much, much, much higher. The weight is going to ride easier on your shoulders. It's just such a better way to do it. And when you do that and you can keep that brace, when you hit the bottom and change direction, everything should be so much tighter. It should also contribute to a radiation. Like a handshake's a good example. If you shake somebody's hand, you really squeeze. The harder you, you squeeze, it's not just the muscles of your forearm. You're gonna start to feel your bicep, tricep, even your shoulder, your lat, your pec. I mean, how many guys have you heard uh, torn or strained a pec deadlifting? It's the same idea. Well, again, going back to the bench, if you squeeze a bench bar, you're actually going to be able to exert more force from the tricep. Um, just like when you shake somebody's hand, you feel your shoulder and your lats tense up. Same idea. So keeping the midsection tight should actually help facilitate movement throughout the chain all the way down to your feet. Number five, grip and backs. So we're just talking about where the bar's riding and how tight you are through your upper back. Grip is a really personal thing, but I know a lot of guys, they get tight. They have trouble. I get in that position where it's really hard to not feel like I'm going to break my arm. And I found a couple tricks that make it a little bit better uh, without having to do years worth of stretching to accommodate that position. You don't want the weight in your hands. The hands should be tight. You should be tense to your back, but you don't want the weight in your hands. You want it on your back. The hands are just there to make sure it doesn't go anywhere. So one is wrapping the wrists and letting the wrist break back. That's something that I've had a lot of success with. Two, I know somebody who would drop the pinky, which kind of lets the wrist come in a little bit. That was also productive. I actually also like to go thumbless and I'll aim for the bar right here where I'll hook around. I find that also puts a lot less stress. You can also play with your elbows. If you drop your elbows down, what you're gonna find is the bar rolls down a little bit, but supports more uh, firmly on your shoulders. So that's something you can try out. I like to do that as I get to the bottom of a squat where I'll drop the elbows down and it reinforces my chest coming up, shifts the load closer to my hips. It's a really good cue. So experiment, find what works for you. But if you feel all kinds of pressure through your chest or shoulders, that's no bueno. You're gonna get bicep tendonitis. I actually popped my AC joint a long time ago, the cartilage right here on my shoulder because I had so much tension on a squat and it wasn't a bad injury, but I couldn't do anything without pain for like three months. So don't get yourself in that position. As far as your back, just like your abs, don't take it for granted. I know I'm telling you to squeeze everything all at once, but one of the things I like to do to facilitate a strong pick off the rack is when I get my hands set, I get the bar picked right before I pick, I will pull down like I'm doing a lat pull down just a little bit, just feel my lats tense up. And as I brace and I get everything set and I roll my hips forward to get up under the bar, that tension makes the bar just fly right up. And I don't have to think about it so hard after I do that. So if you feel like you're not as stable, if your chest is dumping, you're not quite as tight, very, very easy thing you can do right there. Number six, worried about the change of direction. This is by far the most important part of the squat because if you don't change direction well, the rest of the lift or the rest of the set is going to be screwed. There's a lot of different ways to do it depending on how you squat. Some people rebound violently, which is fine. People act like it's easier to do that. It's not. It takes years of training to be able to get that rebound, that pop uh, with that much force. If somebody who's not used to it tries to do that, you're probably gonna tear something. One of the most impressive things I ever saw was Pat Mendez's 800 pound squat. I've mentioned it a bunch of times, simply because of the speed with which he hit the hole and he recovered and grinded through it. It was, it was insane. And the depth, by the way, was absolutely ridiculous. Now you need to figure out, are you gonna be a violent rebounder? I don't recommend most people who aren't Olympic weightlifters do that, but you can get comfortable with some rebound. On the other hand, you have the human forklifts who come down, it's like there's a winch. They just come down slowly, they find that spot, and then they crank back up in the other direction. That's generally gonna be people who are a bit wider, a lot more hip engagement, you get a lot more control. If you use your quads a lot, it's a lot harder to come down with that painstakingly slow descent. Uh, you're probably gonna rely on a little bit more of a rebound, just a soft rebound. Doesn't matter. Set your depth, figure out what's good enough for what you're trying to do. Do that every time. The cadence, the pacing, unless you're doing a variation, like a pause or something, come down, know exactly when you have to tense up and practice riding out of that rebound and you will just get nasty good at it. And it's the same if you're a really controlled squatter. Those guys get good because they do that over and over. So extraordinarily important, be consistent with how fast you descend and how exactly you initiate. 
the rebound back up. Number seven, compensatory acceleration. This is a huge one. It's been around for a while, people have talked about it, but you forget, you take it for granted when you're in the throes of your training. Compensatory acceleration just means not coasting. You don't really know it, but when you're going through a lift, especially a set with a lot of reps, it's like when you jog, you're not sprinting as hard as you can until you just get slower and slower. You're cruising. You're finding a pace that allows you to sustain. Same thing on reps. It's, you're only putting out enough effort just to get the bar to lock out and call it a good rep. And you're actually a lot more efficient if you don't push as hard as possible. You can do more reps that way. So we get in the habit of doing that. Now that's where accommodating resistance comes in because as you get stronger, you can take the brakes off. But if the weight gets heavier, you're in some sense, pushing as hard, if not harder, whether you know it or not. Now, without bands or chains, you should still be able to accelerate in the bar and you will find that the sets go a lot different. Your ability to get work with the same weight is not gonna be as high. You're gonna burn out a lot faster, but that's the point. So practicing, once you have the setup, once you're tight, once your cadence on the descent is good, as you come up, practice following through the whole way until the bar is all the way to lock out. You're gonna find it's a different ball game. And it's a very useful tool for developing strength and power, but also for teaching yourself to lift more weight if you find yourself trying to test out a one rep max. Don't just assume that you'll be able to turn it up to 100 at will if you never practice. And number eight is bar position. Going back to a little technique here, I actually recommend that just about everybody get about the same spot with their bar, and that's gonna be riding right on top of your rear delts. It's not super low bar, but it's certainly not high bar. You can get into any squat position you like in that position. You can go wide, narrow, upright, bend over a little bit. I squat narrow to medium with the bar on my rear delts, and I've never had a problem. If you squat high bar, you have to stay upright. You have to be like an Olympic lifter, and you have no play in the joints because if you come forward a little bit, now your leverage is so bad, it's gonna take you off the neck, where the closer that bar is to your hips, you get a little more purchase. So especially on your rear delts, you have some ability, some leverage to push back into it, which gives you a, a wider margin for error. So that's important. High bar squatting is very useful as a supplement because if you're not used to it, you'll find that taking you off at the neck action forces more strength in your upper back, which is a, a desirable thing to have. But for basic developmental work and even for competition, I think most people don't have to quibble with where their bar setup is. Pull your shoulder blades back, find that cap where your rear delts are and Notice that when you glue it there, there's a lot of stuff supporting the bar. It shouldn't slide, it shouldn't go anywhere. So I think that's universally a good starting point. There's gonna be some outliers who really need it in a different position. Eric King was a good friend of mine who squatted wide and high bar. Never really saw that before, but his build, the way his hips were shaped, so the direction his femurs pointed and his anthropometry allowed him to stay really upright while still getting depth, while still taking a really wide squat. He did not have a very common build but there's a lot of people that are gonna quibble. They're gonna move little millimeters, like it makes a difference. Just set it on your rear delts, find where it's locked in, and then go to work. And every rep you do is gonna make it more and more and more and more comfortable and only change that position if you're doing an accessory and that will make your life very easy. Now, if an elite powerlifting coach looks you over and tells you to do something else, do not recommend him to this video. Specific instruction can be taken a bit differently. Um, this is again, surface level, 30,000 foot view. I'm given broad rules for most of you guys that I think will help. Number nine, now we're getting away from technique. Reps, total reps are huge with the squat. Now, accumulating a lot of singles, doubles, and triples is a bit different than doing like sets of 10 and 12. They both have value. But the fact is, if you're routinely getting reps, whether it's in one set or multiple sets, you're still getting extra touches, extra practice hugely important, hugely beneficial, because even though I said in the beginning, squat uh, is not overly technical for most people. For some people, it's a pain in the ass, but for most people, it's not overly technical. It still responds so well to what you would call skill work. So, so many squat programs you see, it's not gonna be so much about effort. It's gonna be about getting touches in, either upping frequency, working up to more work, um, a lot of the most productive squat programs don't have you get close to failure at all. It's all sub max, sub max, sub max. And as you condition your nervous system to it, little things change, your timing gets better, you're more efficient, which means you can do more reps, which means more volume, and all these things lead to a bigger number. So finding ways to get in reps, do not be a guy that does a top set and calls it good, and then wonder why your squat isn't moving. Treat it like a skill, and you're gonna get the best of all worlds. You're gonna get a ton of volume with a lot of weight, you're going to improve your uh, neurological approach to it. Your time
timing, your rate of force development is going to go up. You're going to see your squat improve. It's only when you cut those reps out that you see it get stagnant. So that's a big one. Now, I am a fan of high rep stuff. If you're not used to it, don't dive in the deep end, but you'll be amazed when you start putting in AMRAPs, even getting a couple reps away from failure, you'll find it's really easy to chase those PRs. It's a really easy way to get some hard effort in at the end of your workout. And those reps matter, even the earlier ones. You know, it's not just the vinegar strokes. Everybody's talking about effective reps these days. Those early reps are hugely important. Where Shaco counts everything over 50% as a working set because it contributes to the overall skill development and tonnage. And it's not gonna be different for any of you guys. So more warm ups are great, more working reps are great, more sub maximal practice work is great. And yes, AMRAPs are great. Reps, 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 get them in. Number 10, and this is just some of my favorite go to accessory things that tend to work for a lot of people. They're universal, but people usually don't incorporate them unless I yell at them to do so. So there's three basic things I would tell you to focus on if you're going to do an accessory heavy type squat split where you're doing a lot of variations in addition to your main squat work. You wanna focus on the bottom position, which we just covered. Pause work is about as good as it gets for that. Whether or not you do a slow squat or a really heavy bounce squat, pause work at the bottom will make you better. Getting just below where you're comfortable going, holding it for a hard two count and compensatory acceleration out of the hole will teach you to be just lightning fast once you bring that bounce back into it. Box squats are another option, although it can get tricky because sometimes you'll modify your stance or the pattern won't, buy, won't be quite the same way, but you still get the benefit of developing lightning fast hips. If you come down, relax your hip flexors and then launch off the box from a dead stop. You'll be amazed as you do those week after week when you're new to it, how quickly you get really fast off the box and how deadly that makes you out of the hole. If it's just like benching, if you don't get the bar moving off your chest, you're not gonna complete the lift. The start is the lift. That's the most important thing. Now beyond that, positioning, I don't like to work weak points so much with squatting because squatting by itself tends to be a remedy anyways. It's like you tend to get your squat better and your weak point just shifts up a little bit. You're always gonna be weak somewhere. Instead, I like to think of reinforcing your squat where it tends to fail universally. You have to assume that whatever position you're squatting in is gonna be kind of the most balanced, secure position. It's usually gonna be kind of in the middle of two extremes. So it's a good idea to do some work in those extremes to make you reinforce should you find yourself breaking some way on the way up. So those extremes are staying very, very upright or bending way, way over. Both of those are very good accessory approaches. Everybody should have some blend of that in their training. If you're a squat morning type of guy, your accessory split might be a little bit different than somebody who's an Olympic lifter and stay super upright the whole time. But for the average squatter, it's a good idea to do, to do something that is very upright. Front squats, true blue high bar squats are good. Safeties, yeah, safety's okay. Um, but I would say you're probably better off doing a true high bar squat or a front squat if you can get away with it. And then on the other end, Good mornings are good or practicing low bar if you've never done low bar before. And what you're gonna find is getting those different positions is gonna provide a ton of insulation on your regular squat as long as you make it par for the course. You don't necessarily need to do all of those at the same time, but I think it's a good idea to cycle them in, pick one, do it for long enough that you notice you're better at it in conjunction with your regular squatting and then transition to something else into another block. It's a really easy way to run it. Keeps training fresh, keeps you chasing PRs. Make sure that no obvious weaknesses develop and the movement should be close enough that they provide some direct carryover regardless. Meaning as you get it better within the block, your squat should be getting better as well. So that's my two cents. That's my general approach. Of course, there are a bunch of different variations. You don't need to get crazy with them. There is no prize or trophy for doing them all. Find things at work and drill those as much as you can. That's about all there is to it. Thanks so much for watching guys. I know there's a lot of surface level stuff. If any of you have questions, you can take it over to Patreon and I can give direct insight because that is where I help people with form checks. That's where I respond to messages. So hit me up on Patreon until next time. This is Bromley. I'll see you.